So we're here not to hear the dean talk about the graduate school, but we're here because we have an incredible keynote speaker today. And it's one of the GSBS's own. I have the incredible honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mary Guinan. Dr. Guinan is a 1969 graduate. I think there's some symmetry there with, with the number 50, don't you? Yes. Right? <laughs> so she's a 1969 graduate and arguably one of the most accomplished scientists that the GSBS has trained over its 50-year history. She's had an enormous impact on science and public health in the United States and around the world. It wasn't easy for Dr. Guinan. Mary truly prevailed at a time when it was difficult for women to attain advanced degrees and to be treated equitably in the job market. And she'll talk about some of that today. After receiving a degree in chemistry, she became interested in graduate school. She applied to UTMB and received an acceptance from the Department of Physiology. After UTMB, she achieved a lifelong goal to obtain an MD degree at Johns Hopkins. During that time, she heard of a plan to eradicate smallpox. And well, the rest is history after that. She joined the CDC and the Epidemic Intelligence Service to work on smallpox eradication. She went on to many other leadership positions over her nearly 25 years at the CDC, including becoming the first woman associate director for science at the CDC, the assistant director for evaluation in the office of HIV AIDS, and chief of the urban research centers, among other positions there. She was among the first scientists in America to identify the emerging AIDS cases as a new disease. After CDC in 2004, she became the founding dean of the School of Public Health at UNLV, and she currently holds the Dean Emerita title. We have honored Mary before. She, she's come back to her campus every time we've asked her. She was recognized in 2001 as the GSBS Distinguished Alumnus for bringing honor to the graduate school in UTMB for a career in public health dedicated to improving the lives of the underserved. She remains active in public health issues today. And, it's, and uh, when I was talking with Mary to invite her to come down to give the keynote address, um, she asked if it was OK to be controversial today. And my answer was, Mary, be as controversial as you'd like. So it is a genuine pleasure to introduce an outstanding educator, researcher, and administrator, Dr. Mary Guinan. Thank you. Her address today is Strengthening Science for a New Age. Mary. Thank you. <sighs> what an honor to be here. I'm so honored to be here to celebrate the amazing achievements of UTMB classes of 1969 and to recognize 50 years of students and faculty members who have contributed to those achievements. I know that I would never have had the career I had if it hadn't been for my education at UTMB. And I'd like to give you a glimpse of my experience. I was born in New York City, the middle of five children of Irish immigrant parents. My father died young, and we children worked our way through college. I attended Hunter College, part of the City University of New York, which was free for those who had good grades. At the end of my first year, my chemistry professor told me that I had done well, and he asked me to consider making chemistry my major. I never considered working in science, and I was hesitant, very hesitant. He suggested I take the next course and see how I did. I eventually graduated with a chemistry major, which would never have happened if that professor hadn't encouraged me. Then came the hard part. I couldn't find a job. At that time in New York, in the early 60s, the New York Times uh, want ads were segregated. One section was for help wanted male, and the other section was for help wanted female. 
and there was never an ad for a chemist in the female listings. After searching for months, I finally landed a job. I was at the Ameri it was at the American Chickle Division of Warner Labert Pharmaceutical Company in New York. I was hired as a flavor chemist in the chewing gum factory. <laughs> it's true. My job was to find new flavors for chewing gum. I was the only female chemist, and after about a year of making and testing new flavors, I found out that the male chemists were paid considerably more than I was. It was pretty humiliating. I decided then that my best option was to get an advanced degree. I wanted to find a career that would be more satisfying and paid reasonably. I applied to 10 graduate schools in different parts of the country. I was rejected by all of them. Either they didn't accept women or they did not provide stipends for women graduate students. I was very discouraged. And then something wonderful happened. I came upon an ad in a medical journal, which was from the UTMB physiology department. The department was looking for qualified students seeking advanced degrees, and scholarships were available. I sent a handwritten note with my resume to the chair of the physiology department, Dr. Mason Guest. I didn't mention the chewing gum factory in my resume. <laughs> I just said that I was working as a chemist for a pharmaceutical company. Two weeks later, I received a letter from Dr. Guest congratulating me on being accepted into the program, but it said nothing about the fellowship. I wrote another letter to Dr. Guest asking about the fellowship. Dr. Guest returned my letter with a handwritten note at the bottom of the page saying, we are holding one for you. It was one of the most exciting days of my life. I arrived in Galveston in 1964, one year after the assassination of President Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson was president, and the space race between the Soviet Union and the USA to get to the moon was in full swing. It is difficult to describe the intensity of the Cold War at that time. The general belief was that whichever one got to the moon first would control the world. Didn't quite turn out that way, but that's what people believed, and there was this incredible race that we had to get to the moon first. The Manned Spacecraft Center was in Houston, and Command Central would be the most important unit for getting astronauts to the moon and back. For the first two years, many of my classes were with medical students, and every so often, one of the astronauts who had already been in space would come to the class and tell us stories about their experiences in space. It was incredibly exciting. As I started to work on my dissertation, Dr. Guess asked me if I, thought, if I had thought about what I wanted to do as a career choice. I answered that I had thought a lot about it, but I was hesitant to tell him what I wanted to do. I had never told anyone. Finally, I told him I wanted to try to become an astronaut. Dr. Guess was a man of few words. He paused for a very long time. Finally, he said, Mary, NASA wants scientists in the space program. If you have to prove your, you first have to prove yourself as a scientist. He helped me choose a subject for my dissertation that had some relevance to the state program. What he didn't say was women aren't being accepted into the program. He never mentioned it. Of course, I knew that. I knew that women weren't even allowed to enter Command Central in Houston, even to bring coffee because it might distract the men. So the likelihood was small. If you look at any of the films from the moon landing in 1969, there were no women. I knew it was a long shot, but I wanted to try. Well, it wasn't to be. 
After finishing my dissertation, I took an introductory class at NASA for scientists interested in the space program. I was the only woman in a class of 12. At the end of the class, we were asked to fill out an application concerning physical qualifications. It turns out that I was the only one in the class that had all the physical requirements, which included 20-20 vision and the required height and weight. At that time, astronauts had to fly in a capsule, which was relatively small, so one couldn't be too tall or too wide. Despite having the physical requirements, I was not asked to join the program. The first astronauts, a group of seven, were all test pilots, really tough guys. I mean, test pilots. So one of the things I did to improve my resume <laughs> was to take flying lessons. The Texas Longhorn Flying Club in Galveston gave students at UTMB a significant discount for flying lessons. To pay for the lessons, I worked as a waitress at the Jack Tar Hotel. Well, as I said, it wasn't meant to be, but I don't think that my having a pilot's license would have helped me. But with the health doctor guest, I applied for a postdoctoral fellowship at NIH and was accepted at the National Institute of Heart and Lung and Blood. My work was in blood coagulation. During the free time, I searched for a job. I was interviewed for many, but was not hired. The reason given was that I was likely to get married and have children and stop working. All that investment would be by the employers would be lost. That was the norm then. Women who had children became stay-at-home moms. At NIH, most of the jobs available required an MD degree. I was living in Maryland, so I applied to two medical schools, the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins. I was accepted at Hopkins and rejected by the University of Maryland. I was amazed. <laughs> I completed medical school and did a residency in internal medicine and planned to continue training in hematology and oncology. But I became aware of the WHO worldwide program to eradicate smallpox from the world. Imagine, the World Health Organization convinced every country of the world to participate. And if successful, it would be the first time in history that a deadly disease of humans would be eliminated from the world by the design of humans. I wanted to participate. WHO had designated an agency in each country that managed the smallpox eradication program. The agency in the US was the Centers for Disease Control. I applied to CDC, was accepted into their epidemic intelligence program. This is a two-year program in epidemiology during which we are tr trained how to recognize and control epidemics. We would become medical epidemiologists, also known as medical detectives. During the first year, 1975, 1974, I volunteered to join the smallpox eradication program, and I was sent to India. I had incredible experiences while there. I was in Uttar Pradesh, in a remote part of northern India for five months. I was assigned a jeep and a driver and a paramedical assistant. We went from village to village searching for smallpox cases. If we found a village with smallpox, we would vaccinate everyone within a 10-mile radius. Smallpox is spread from person to person. So the idea was that transmission would be interrupted by surrounding the cases with a ring of immunity. The program was remarkably successful. In 1977, the world was declared free of smallpox. It was very rewarding to be a part of such a successful program. And I found what I wanted to do. I was going to spend the rest of my career in public health working to prevent disease and injury. But first, I wanted to take a break and enjoy life. I left CDC after two years 
and began a fellowship in infectious disease at the University of Utah. I had gone on a few skiing trips to Utah and I thought it could imp I could improve my seeing and have more fun. As luck would have it, there was no snow in Utah that year. <laughs> At the University of Utah, I began studying herpes virus. And I did a study on the use of topical ether to treat cold sores. They're also called oral herpes infection. I present the results of the study at a national meeting in a special session on herpes virus. There were 12 speakers at the session, and they spoke on different herpes viruses, including that, those that are sexually transmitted. Because of the media interest, all 11 speakers at the session were asked to attend a briefing, a press briefing afterwards. That evening, I turned on the six o'clock news, CBS News. During the program, I was astonished to see myself appear on the TV screen with a voiceover from Dan Rather saying, Dr. Mary Guinan, expert in genital herpes infection. but never doubt the influence of the media. I, I returned to Utah and was met at the airport by two reporters, one from the local CBS affiliate and one from the local newspaper. The University of Utah PR department was delighted to discover it had an expert in genital herpes infection and had provided the media with information on my flight arrival. Despite my explanation of the error, both the TV and the newspaper reports stated that I was an expert in genital herpes infection. I was inundated with calls and requests from people wanting to see me. I stopped answering the telephone. I, I, it was just impossible for me to answer all of those uh, phone calls. And then I had a call from the dean's office saying they had numerous complaints about my not answering the phone <laughs> and not accepting appointments. Please rectify. So I started seeing patients with genital herpes infection. Most of them were young married women who were afraid if they got pregnant, they would transmit the virus to their newborn. Newborn herpes infection is extremely dangerous, often ending in death or, severely, or a severely impaired child. There was no treatment at that available then. I saw my first case of newborn herpes infection in Utah, and I'll never forget it. The infection left the child in a semi-comatose state for the rest of his life. Something had to be done to prevent this infection, but what? So I started doing studies with women, with these women, and I eventually was linked to an ongoing study of a new treatment. The treatment was acyclovir, and it proved to be very effective in the treatment of most herpes infections. I completed my studies in Utah and was recruited back to CDC as their herpes expert in a unit called the Venereal Disease Control Division. A few months after I arrived, the TV program, 60 Minutes, asked CDC if I would appear on their program uh, to talk about genital herpes infection. CDC agreed, and a team from 60 Minutes came to my office and filmed the interview over a several hour period, and then scheduled it to air six weeks later. During that interval, CDC was very concerned about how our organization would be portrayed by the show, given the tendency for um, 60 Minutes to make the interviewee look like the bad guy. But I was worried about what my mother was going to think. <laughs> she was a religious woman in her 70s who never mentioned the word sex in our household. 
When I told her I was going to be on 60 Minutes, she was delighted and told all her church group, <laughs> her, senior, it's her senior citizens group, and all our relatives and friends. The 60 Minute episode opened with the question, Dr. Guinan, which venereal disease would you least like to have? <laughs> this is true. Because they hadn't asked me that question during the interview, they made up an answer using clips from the film where I was talking about gonorrhea, syphilis, genital herpes, and of course, oral genital sex. After the airing, my mother was the first to call. She said, congratulations, dear. Your hair looked very nice. <laughs> she couldn't deal with the subject matter, but she found a way to give me her approval. After that, I never worried about what people thought about working on sexual issues. I stayed at CDC for 22 years, working first on sexually transmitted diseases, and then in 1981, I became part of the task force that investigated the first cases of AIDS. I then spent the rest of my CDC years working on AIDS. It was a very difficult time. It wasn't until 1966 that an effective treatment for HIV AIDS became available. I retired from CDC and became the State Health Officer for Nevada and eventually became the Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I have had a wonderful career and can honestly say that UTMB gave me the start that I needed. Imagine. If I hadn't been accepted by UTNB, I might still be working in that chewing gum factory. <laughs> now I'd like to say a few words about the future of science at universities. I believe that advances in science are so rapid in some areas that it's difficult to predict how science will evolve in the future. As former dean of a state university, which is supported by state taxes, I believe that state universities have an obligation to do scientific research which addresses the problems in their state. A good working relationship between the university, the health department, and nonprofit organizations and other do-gooders is important, very important. But I know it is difficult. Right now, the United States is in the midst of the worst epidemic of addiction in the history of our country, and there's no end in sight. We have to invest in the science of addiction. The epidemic started 20 years ago. At that time, addiction was not considered a disease, but a criminal offense. The criminal justice system was arresting and incarcerating large numbers of addicts. Fortunately, this is changing. There is ample evidence that drug and alcohol addiction are diseases, and it is clear that some people have genes and environments that make them more susceptible to these diseases. One of the lethal qualities, one of the le lethal qualities of opioids is the drug's ability to get to the part of the brain that keeps us breathing. The drug can stop the breathing and cause death. In 2017, the CDC reported that over 300,000 deaths have occurred, overdose, death, overdose deaths have occurred in our country since the beginning of the epidemic. And there may be many more. That was 2017 data. And the CDC cautioned this may be an underestimate since there is not a standardized system for reporting overdose deaths. And there is a severe shortage of healthcare work workers who understand, who, who are qualified to, to treat people with uh, addiction. The, per the people uh, who are qualified are very small and 
for what is called now opiate use disorder, the stigma of addiction as a personal moral failure rather than a disease still exists. Very few healthcare providers are interested in taking care of those with substance abuse disorders. I think that we should examine the role of universities in advancing programs for training students to be interested in the needs of our states in caring for those afflicted. We need physicians, nurses, social and behavioral scientists, epidemiologists, statisticians, all who have specific expertise in addiction. We also need universities to do research on what works in our individual communities to prevent opioid addiction and what treatments work. Think about it. Is it possible that in the future scientists might be able to develop a vaccine that could prevent addiction? Imagine, who knows? But we do know that we have to start a massive effort to prevent and control this epidemic. Finally, I'm going to come to the controversial part, or maybe that was controversial. <laughs> I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about an effort to prevent addicted infants. An opioid addicted infant is born every 15 minutes in the United States. Every 15 minutes. That means that annually, 35,000 addicted newborns are going through the pain and suffering of withdrawal. The average cost to treat withdrawal of infants just for the first week of life is $60,000. The total annual cost is well over $20 billion. Given the seriousness of the illness and the soaring cost, it is remarkable that public health agencies have not recommended guidelines for the prevention of addicted infants. Why would that be? Why aren't federal public health uh, agencies giving recommendations on how to prevent disease? Isn't that their job? Well, I know why the CDC has not recommended has no recommendations for the prevention of addiction. Because CDC is not allowed to talk about contraception. And contraception is the key to prevent addicted infants. That is why it's so important that states start to develop guidelines for the prevention of newborn addiction. I believe that many of you here do not know what a LARC is. LARC, L-A-R-C. LARC is an acronym for Long Acting Reversible Contraception. LARCs are close to 100% effective in preventing pregnancy. There are several kinds of LARC. The, most, the two most common are IUDs and implants. A woman with a LARC is protected for pregnancy for from three to 10 years, depending on the, depending on the device. There are other contraceptives but they are not used consistently and therefore are not so effective. LARCs are close to 100% effective in preventing pregnancy. Why wouldn't we choose the best? Whatever, you state, whatever state you live in, it is receiving funds from the federal government for control of the opioid epidemic. These federal funds can be used to provide LARCs for addicted women. LARC are expensive, approximately $800 to $900. In states with the expanded Medicaid option, Med Medicaid will pay for a LARC. LARC are safe and effective. They are, recommend, they are the recommended choice for pregnancy prevention by the American College of OBGYN and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Your state legislators, whatever state you're in, is deciding on how they spend opioid money. 70% of state legislators are men. Actually, in Texas, it's 80%. I believe that few of them know about LARC as a powerful tool to prevent addicted infants. 
Women with substance abuse disorder have a need that men do not have. That is the need to prevent unplanned pregnancies. And this need has been completely ignored. It is time to educate our legislators and hold them accountable to help prevent addicted infants. Thank you very much for being here. I welcome your questions and comments. Well, it would be the state decides on health. In other words, they have the primacy in matters of health, not the federal government. So each state, and each state is different, what they would do. But there are, right now in Nevada, for example, where I, I live, they have a program in which they are working with the community to expand contraception throughout all of Las Vegas, to expand it. And it's really difficult to be able to identify uh, those that need it most or how to uh, find the women that you would hope would, uh, would be interested in having that if they are addicted in, in it. And it, it's something that most addicted women who have infants, they're unplanned pregnancies. So if women were offered the LARC, then they could, uh, they, would, they would prevent, ha they would not have addicted infants. But uh, it's not easy to identify them and find them. But the idea is that giving it to all women, providing uh, this lark for all women who of reproductive age who want it in um, Las Vegas will bring in all of the people that we want to target. So that's how it's starting. Uh, I'll tell you about the miracle that happened in Nevada. The miracle in Nevada is that not since 1776, the beginning of our country, has there been a state legislature that is a majority women? Last year, Nevada came the first state in the nation to have a majority female legislature. Now, <laughs> yes. And I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> It was wonderful, it's wonderful. And all of those women understand about LARCs. They know all about it. They are the ones that are pushing this whole program. And um, I think that, especially I'd like to talk to the men here, to talk to, the, that, to, talk to your legislators. Just send them a, an email, send them a, a text message or whatever. Send them a letter saying, do you know about LARCs and how they can prevent addicted babies? Now, how many legislators do you think know about that? Very few. And they are really adverse. All state legislators that I've dealt with are adverse to talking about anything about contraception because it's too controversial. Oh, that's one, one of my aides will help you. They don't want to know. so. It's a woman's issue, it's not a woman's issue. It's a family issue, it's a community issue, it's a state issue, it's a uh, national issue. We really have to understand what the needs of addicted women are, especially for uh, prevention of pregnancy. So I think that the whole idea, remember, whatever state you live in, it is your state legislator that's making the decisions. So if you just contact them and ask them about LARCs, you could educate them and maybe even convince them that this is what they should be doing. Party. Party.
are there any long-term effects of using widespread water? And also, uh, what, I guess, what do families, or how do you seek out these families that might be candidates for water? You said just to across the board give it to everyone? Uh, long-term yeah, well, this is a, a very difficult problem, how to, how to engage with the population that we want to. And I think uh, it's very difficult to do. But um, from a point of view, one of the things that addicted women do is exchange sex for drugs. This is a very common thing, and it's a heartbreaking thing that mothers of, of women who are addicted and don't know where their children are, they look online for these ads that women put online to find out if their children are alive, saying, you know, we'll exchange uh, drugs for sex. So they are all online. And the problem with what's happening then is these women are getting HIV infection, uh, syphilis, and all other kinds of, of problems uh, besides their addiction. And that ends up in having babies who have congenital syphilis. In Nevada, we have the second highest rate of uh, uh, neonatal uh, syphilis in the country. And it's all related to drugs and women exchanging sex, uh, sex for drugs. So, and in other parts of the country. Now, as far as how safe it is, there's been a couple of long-term studies, uh, not very long studies on this. And I would, um, the state of Colorado uh, uh, started several years ago, a donor, an anonymous donor, donated to the state of uh, Colorado, $20 million to increase the uh, ability, to increase the availability of contraception to the whole state, the whole state. And they, they, they could use larks or other contraceptives, but since larks are the most effective, these are the ones that have been used and they had over a three-year period they had an incredible thing happened they had a huge reduction in um, in unplanned pregnancies but they also had a big huge reduction in abortions because women who have uh, larks don't need abortions they are so effective, imagine something that's 100, almost 100% effective. So, and they have on their website, the uh, public health website uh, in uh, Colorado, that all of the good things that are happened to, through this program, so, and it's there, and all the statistics are there, they've looked at it, and how much money is saved, how much money is saved. And LARCs will save money for the state, preventing those addicted babies that they pay for, pre preventing putting you know, these children into foster care. So it's, it's essentially saved the state lots of money. So that's one big factor. As far as long-term effects, there are several studies that have been done, but you know they're not so long term. I don't know how long long term will be, but uh, during the Zika virus uh, outbreak, and Puerto Rico was the place in the United States from the United States that was most affected by that. They had this program to introduce uh, contraception, including larks to all women of childbearing age in one area of Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, it was very successful. All of the women 
who wanted a contraception got this. 68% of those chose larks. And there was a dramatic decrease in the number of plant, unplanned pregnancies and a lowering of having uh, children affected by uh, Zika virus, which is brain damage. So brain damage. So, um, so there are a number of studies. And yes, the OBGYN and the, and the, the people, uh, the uh, American, American Academy of Pediatrics recommend LARC. So it's their recommendation, the first line of defense, because it's the most effective. So uh, we don't really have any information about longer term effects. Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad this is your controversial issue. I don't think it's controversial at all. I think it's, it's <laughs> critical. Um, I, you know, I read the other day, nearly nine in 10 women with opioid use disorder have an unplanned pregnancy, nine in 10. That's an astronomical number. I had the chance to visit University of Vermont a couple weeks ago. She's doing one of the only phase two clinical trials where they're working with women with opioid use disorder and using the WHO's guidelines, they're actually pairing them with a specific contraceptive strategy and there's some evidence that can actually improve OED outcomes. Now, anecdotally, the biggest problem with those clinical trials is cost. Um, to conduct these larger phase two B, phase three clinical trials, it costs a lot of money to give contraception. And so I wanted to ask you, what role do you think the NIH needs to play in order to expand funding opportunities to specifically look at women with OUD? Well, I can tell you that federal agencies are handicapped in working on contraception. They are because it's controversial to them. And C CDC, where I worked for many years, I know I could never speak out. I couldn't speak out on any, uh, there were, you know, when I used to see, I worked in a clinic at, uh, when I was at CDC one day a week taking care of patients and I uh, used to see a lot of the women patients, especially those from the jails. And these women would have multiple sexually transmitted disease and be pregnant. And that was, there was this uh, terrible conjoining of epidemics at that time in the early AIDS epidemic and the crack cocaine epidemic hit. So we had all these women who were, uh, were addicted, were put into crack houses and would be there because the, I, the what, how the crack cocaine uh, people help to get people addicted was they would say you get the most incredible ex sexual experience of your life on crack cocaine. So that what they would have is these crack houses where they would provide women to, to the people to addict them. And, and these women were just gang raped many times and they were having babies and I wanted to in the clinic that I worked in, I wanted to get birth control. Now, certainly I could write a script, but they can't afford it and get birth control. There was, no, I couldn't ask her. They wouldn't let me talk about it. I couldn't talk about the needs of women to prevent pregnancy. And then when these women did get pregnant and they did maybe uh, have HIV, a child with HIV infection, they were, they were condemned for being such horrible women, how could they do that? But never offered contraception. Well, I think uh, you should look at the, uh, the CDC website. One of the unfortunate things that's happening at CDC is that they're reducing the numbers of, they're reducing the, the um, number of 
people in the epidemic intelligence service. It's a two-year program. When I was there, uh, there was about 20 to 30 people in my class, but it eventually grew so there were about 75 uh, students. Now they're cutting the funding for the epidemic intelligence service so that fewer people are being, uh, are being brought into the program, which is, for me, it's a disaster because it's such a wonderful way of introducing people to public health and becoming aware. And so, uh, but I think you need to look at CDC's website, look at what the qualifications, look what they're, what are they looking for? And then uh, apply or write to someone there. They, they'll give you somebody who runs the program and say, you know, what do I need to qualify to be in this program? Because I'm maybe the qualifications are changing since I was there. Uh, but I think it's important if you're interested to, to go right to that to CDC and find out, go to it. And then if there are other people that you know in the program, they could um, might be able to help you and uh, provide a reference for you so that you would get a reference. So if you knew someone who you know, was connected with someone at CDC, that's a very good way to sort of make people aware of you because then somebody from CDC who has experience at CDC is, uh, is giving you that reference. Well, I can tell you that Dr. Mason Guest was a person who was my mentor, and he was wonderful. I, but he was a man of few words. He rarely said anything to me. He never, but if I would ask him something, he would think about it and then answer me. But I trusted him. I mean, he always told me something so it has to be trust that, you know, so like he didn't tell anybody, you know, Mary Guinan wants to be an astronaut. Can you believe that? She'd never make that. You know, you know that sort of thing. You, you knew. He never told anybody about that. And uh, he, so he was like this very important. I've written a book called, uh, it's about my experiences at CDC. And it's called uh, Adventures of a Female Medical Detective. And it talks about Dr. Guest. And he, at UTMB, is the person that was my best mentor. You know, he just, he believed me. And he didn't say to me, are you crazy? You know, do you do that? He said, you have to, they're looking for scientists. You have to become a good scientist. That's what you have to do. First, that's your first step. And he was correct. And then I didn't make it, but at least, you know, I tried and then I managed to go elsewhere. From then on, I didn't have very many mentors throughout CDC. Not at all. I mean, I had wonderful people to work with. It's a wonderful place to work. It was a, I loved the whole thing. But I very often I know that I wasn't, uh, you know, I was, I was not considered promotable, you know, the women didn't get promoted and all of that, but it was a really interesting way how I, I got to be the assistant director for science at CDC. I was the first woman to become, and it, it turned out when I was in Utah, I, uh, I, I, I didn't tell you that I used to be a, uh, an addict to a drug which is cigarettes. I, I loved smoking. It was so cool. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I smoked and smoked and uh, for 10 years and in medical school, I'm smoking and you know, telling everyone else not to smoke. So I, I 
I stopped every, I, I finally stopped smoking, but I stopped many times, many times too. So uh, I, I finally stopped smoking and uh, I started to gain weight. And I, you know, it very often happens. And I gained weight, and I uh, was, I started at CD, I was at CDC when I gained this weight, and I, I was very unhappy. So I just started running. I used to go to the Emory, is down the street from CDC. I started running on the track. And I soon got to where I was uh, running. And I ran, uh, I started, I got up to seven miles, I mean, I would, seven miles, and so I was so excited about this. And then when I moved to Utah, the head, one of the physicians was, uh, who would, he eventually became the head, of, the director of CDC, His name is James Mason. He was in Utah, and he was also a runner. So he was, you know, the person who supervised me on various things, and we got involved in running and how I was running, and I decided that I was going to run the Boston Marathon. And, uh, you know, people say, oh, right, yeah, you're gonna do that. But that was my goal, and uh, I, so I, eventually, I ran the Boston Marathon and finished within, an, within four hours. That was my goal. So Dr. Mason, the doctor, uh, I'm sorry. So he eventually became the head of CDC. And since he was friendly with me, he came to CDC and I was at my desk one day and he called me up and he said, Mary, there aren't any women here in the top office. I want you to apply to be my associate director for science. I almost fell out of the chair. So that's how I had this person. I was running and became friends with him. So it's, it's one of those things that you never know who actually will say, hey, she knows what she's doing. And there are very few people who do that. So uh, that was another place where I was lucky. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, uh, do you have any recommendations or uh, tips for women uh, going to grad school and eventually going to the job field? Like, what would you suggest to make uh, yourself competitive? Or, uh, well, one of the things that I, I recommend to students now that I have been the dean and understand what goes on is that you have to learn how to set up your CV. It's absolutely critical. Many of the students at UNLV used to send, you know, when they were going through, they used to send this res same resume out like to 15 different places and they get no response. I started to, when I found out what was happening, I said, you cannot do that. You need to have a resume that immediately answers what that job once, and you put those first. I do this, I do this, I do this, because who reads when, when they're looking for jobs? Who reads first? It's the HR department. And what they do is if you don't have the characteristics right there in the front of your CV, they just throw it in the trash and no one sees you. So you have to be very careful about addressing what they want in their scientist, okay? And you then put your criteria up, say, I do this, I do this, I do this. And if you say, uh, I don't have X, but I can do this, I can, I can fix that, you know, I can. So I think that was um, the scientist, the first scientist that I dealt with on this sent out 15 resumes and got no response. And then she rewrote her, res her resume and I helped her with it. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, she also had run the Boston Marathon. So she put that on her CV. I said, that's great. Say that you, because somebody knows, look, you've done something exciting. 
And so she did that. So uh, she redid the resume and sent out 15 more resumes, all different. She got 15 responses. So now she's teaching at UNLV all the students how to make a resume. Well, Mary, thank you. Thank you for your time today. We have a little oh. token for you here. One is a special medallion that's been struck for our 50th anniversary. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah, and um, you can wear that around the house. Or yes, <laughs> How about that? All right. Let's have a round of applause for Mary. All right, I've got a few more things to tell you. Can somebody bring back up the slides for just a moment? Thank you. So by the way, while we're waiting for that, oh, it came up right away. This is Mary's book. Um, and this is going to be available as a silent auction item. Dr. Guinan brought several copies. We will auction these off tomorrow at the symposium and at the dinner tomorrow night. Uh, all proceeds from Mary will go to the 50 for 50 campaign. Bring your wallets, right? <laughs> One last thing that's kind of fun is and this is amazing, for the first time ever, we're gonna to put together a time capsule, okay? It's never been done at UTMB. And we're gonna put a bunch of items from this 50th anniversary year. We're gonna put, we're gonna ask students to put, maybe nominate a paper from their program by a student that they think is really noteworthy. Uh, we're gonna put in all kinds of things. I've been, I've been threatening to put in a thumb drive with some video on it and see if people in 25 years can open it, right? <laughs> I mean, that might be, a, that might be a great challenge right there. But one thing that we, we're gonna open this up to everybody is there's some, gonna be some cards available and you can write a, write a note to your colleagues in the future, okay? And uh, this will allow you to either give advice or, or pose a question to them. And it'll be opened up in 2044. We're gonna bury it in the rare book collection at Moody Medical Library. Gonna hold the key in the graduate school so nobody can break in, right? But it'll be opened in 2044 on our 75th anniversary. So it should be a bunch of fun and it should be something interesting for our colleagues in the future to, to open up. So let's make it interesting for them. So at this point, uh, let's retire to the foyer. There's, uh, there's great food, libation, conversation with our guests. <laughs>